Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the future. We're going to look at remote viewing the year 2060. My guest is my good friend Stefan Schwartz, author of The Secret Vaults of Time, The Eight Laws of Change, The Alexandria Project, and Opening to the Infinite, as well as several books of fiction. Stefan lives in the state of Washington, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Stefan. It's a pleasure once again to be with you. It's been a long time. It's my pleasure, Jeff. Uh, yes, we've had some good conversations. We, we've had many good conversations. I think you're still the leader when it comes to having done the most interviews on the New Thinking Aloud channel. Uh, and I'm happy to do more because you have a lifelong career of having done really fascinating projects. And today we're going to build on uh, actually an earlier interview we did, I think over five years ago. And, and in fact, I'm going to link to it right now. Uh, it's called Remote Viewing the Future. That describes some of your initial work in, in this remote viewing project. And, and we can summarize it, of course. But um, in recent, in the last year or so, you've been expanding that project, which began looking at the year 2050. Now you're looking at the year 2060 and uh, comparing the two. So let, let's begin by talking a little bit about how the 2060 project came into being. Well, the 2050 project, as you know, uh, I started in 1978 because I was uh, I had left government in 1976, and I had been part of the geopolitical community, and I was special assistant to chief of naval operations. And I left in 76 thinking we were going to have a nuclear war, because that's what most people in the geopolitical world thought. It just seemed like it was going to happen. And I thought, well, I get people to remote view, and I didn't want to get too far ahead uh, of of where we could go because um, I, had a, I had come across a book that Jules Verne wrote in which he described Paris in the 60s back in the 1850s and nobody could understand what he was writing and they'd never published the book until years and years later. So I knew not to get too far ahead because uh, if you get too far ahead, you, you, know, you just don't understand what they're saying. I mean, if you had asked somebody and say, if we've been doing this interview in, I don't know, 1850, and you had described that you had something you could wear on your wrist, which would allow you to talk to anybody in the world, I mean, what would you make of that? And so I went, 2050 seemed like a, a reasonable time. So from 78 to 91, I did 4,000 interviews with people all over the world, asking them to describe the same day in the year 2050. So if it was, for instance, if we were doing it now, I would say, Jeff, I want you to go forward in time to the 14th of June, 2050. What do you see? What's life like? All that kind of thing. Anyway, I got all of this information from them, the viewers, and A, almost everything they said has either happened or is in the process of happening. But B, Many of the things that they told me were simply unbelievable at the time. I'll just give you two examples. Uh, I asked them if there was a nuclear war, because, of course, that's what I was really worried about. And they said no. And I said, oh, well, then the world must be much safer. And they said, no, no, the world is much more uh, dangerous. And I said, why? And they said, because of terrorism. Now, in 1978, the only terrorism that was going on that we were paying much attention to was the Protestant conflict 
in Ireland, you know, the Protestants and the Catholics. So the idea that terrorism would become a massive problem, uh, just I couldn't make any sense of it. And they, uh, then I said, well, you know, what about the Soviet Union? What's happening with the Soviet Union? And to my astonishment, these people, and again, it's not an individual single viewer. What we're talking about here is I interview a lot of people, and what I'm looking for is consensus, where they, a number of them agree. They said, oh, well, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. And I went to a friend of mine who was on the National Security Council with whom I'd been working and said, can you think of any reason that the Soviet Union would disappear? And he said, you know, I don't know. No, no, that's not going to happen. Because, of course, we saw the world in those days in these two big superpowers. But in 1991, the Soviet Union disappeared. And the other example I'll give you is I said, let's talk about health care. And they said to me, they described health care. I would get to that a little later on. But the thing that really stood out for me was they said, well, there was a ser- there's going to be a series of pandemics. I said, pandemics? You know, I'm thinking 1918 Spanish uh, flu, right? And they said, well, th- the first one will be a blood disease that crosses over from primates in Africa to uh, humans and kills millions of people. And I went to a friend of mine who was then the deputy director of National Institutes of Health and said, do you know anything about a blood disease that's about to spread all over the world and kill millions of people that crossed over from primates to humans? And and he said, whatever it is you're smoking, Stefan, quit. (laughs) Because that's crazy talk. And, of course, in 1981, AIDS came. And, uh, but they said there would be a series of these, which was even stranger to me. But then, of course, comes SARS and H5N1, and, and now we're going through COVID. And, of course, now I have a better understanding of these things because I realize that climate change is going to cause viruses and bacteria to mutate, and we're going to have a whole series of these, these pandemics. But, you know, talking to somebody in 78, 79, that 81, 82, that sort of thing, telling you that there are going to be a series of pandemics that are going to kill millions of people all over the world just didn't make any sense. So anyway, I decided there was an outstanding question which I could not answer. And that was when a person gives you a remote viewing uh, data, gives you remote viewing data about an event in the future, are they giving you a fixed future or are they describing the highest probability at the moment you're asking the question? And we don't have an answer for that. So I thought, well, I'll go forward 10 years to 2060, and I will see if the 2060 data materially differs from the 2050 data, because that will answer that question. And um, so I'm in the process of doing the analysis as we speak. And um, uh, I don't have an answer yet, but I should have one in another few months as I continue to work with this. But I have gotten out of 2060 a number of things which are basically uh, continuities of the 2050 data. Um, Climate change, particularly in, in the 2050 data, I would talk to people, let's say you were in Los Angeles, and I'd say, well, Uh, Jeff, you know, what's Los Angeles like in 2050? And they would say things like, well, you know, a a lot of it is underwater. And I thought, underwater? They said, oh, yeah, you know, Santa Monica, uh, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, that's that's all underwater. And when I would interview people who were in Virginia Beach, they would say the same kind of thing to me, or in Norfolk, or when I was... Um, in coastal areas in Europe, and I would do that because I did it with thousands of people, and they would tell me the same thing. Or in Japan, so I didn't know, and I didn't know anything about climate change until 1991, when I read an article in American Scientist. That was the first thing I ever read about climate change. And when I went around and talked to uh, another friend who was uh, one of the directors of the the climate weather research. 
and said, you know, can you tell me about why large parts of Los Angeles would be underwater? Uh, he said, no, I can't tell you that. Where do you get this kind of stuff? And I'd say remote viewing and he would say, oh, God, you know. But the 2060 data uh, continues the same sense of climate change that the 2050s began. And I now see that as a much more significant than most people realize or are preparing for. Well, one of the risks that you've identified uh, with regard to remote viewing the future, of course, is, is that people aren't blind to the target. You're asking them to go to a particular date and location in the future, but also we all have our own intellectual expectations. We're aware of the current trends and we can project those trends forward into the future. It's a simple intellectual exercise. And I know that you've developed a, a part of your methodology this time around to take that into account. Yes, I was going to say uh, that is exactly, you are absolutely correct. And so when I planned the 2060 data, I thought uh, what I will do is I will create a questionnaire and I got a thousand people to specifically not. I, in fact, I tell them this. Don't give me your intuition. Don't give me your speculation. Give me your intellectual assessment based on what you know of what the future will be like. And one of the things that I am comparing is. Do the rationals, that's what we call them, do the rationals have a different view of the future than the people who use non-local consciousness? And um, the answer is they do. That is, they are not the same, that the rationals have different views about this than the, um, than the people who are doing remote viewing. And exactly how detailed that is, as I say, I'm in the process of doing the, the research, but I can say, for instance, something that I just got a hint of in 2050 and didn't get at all from the rationals. Between 2040 and 2045, something really significant is going to happen that's going to change culture very profoundly. Now, I'm not quite sure what it is. It could be uh, the European Union has just committed to exiting uh, carbon powered vehicles by 2035. Um, before it was 2040. The climate change uh, projections also look like they're going to become very dramatic in the 2040 to 2045 range. In the 2060s, Whatever it was that happens, or whatever it is that happens between 2040 and 2045, by 2060 it's over, or the culture has accommodated for it. Because what stood out for me in the 2060s is they would say, "Well, you know, things are back to back to some kind of normality," and and I said, "What do you mean they're back to?" Well, there was this thing that happened in 2040, 2045 that really changed the whole world and uh, but now we've we've sort of adjusted for it and um and we think uh we, we we think we've gotten through it so i don't know what that is i suspect climate change or maybe the exit from uh carbon powered engines um but happily at least uh 2060 they think of themselves as being on the other side of it. I mean, it could be nuclear war for all we know. No, I don't think so, because I haven't had anybody tell, tell me about nuclear war. No, this is, this is something that is dramatic culturally um, and that causes changes in the way we live. For instance, I just to give you some of the examples of this is from the 2060 data. In 2060, I, I was, I have been for some years, as you know, very concerned 
about what I have called the great schism trend, the separation of the blue states and the red states. And, I mean, I really see that as a, as a crisis. And when I talk to the 2060s, they, they tell me that the things that are creating so much crisis for us, the LGBTQ uh, phobias, the white supremacy stuff, that that no longer seems to, I think this is good news, that no longer seems to be a big issue, nor does gender equality seem to be a big issue. They tell me in the, the 2060s that the United States still exists, but in form, but real power has, has, has gone to the states and combinations of regional groups of states, although there still is a federal government. But the sense that you get from the 2060s, which is quite different than you get from the rationals, who mostly see things sort of continuing with the United States in, in leadership, is that from the 2060 remote viewing part, they're now talking about the United States no longer being the world leader in everything, either technology or uh, uh, that it's a country that is that still exists, because I was concerned it might not even exist, that still exists, but is very different than it is today. Uh, people, there have been large movements of people. Um, people are living in smaller communities. There is a kind of minimalist, if I guess that word would work, minimalist culture. The, the descriptions of houses, for instance, that where people live seem much simpler than the rationals describe or um, than most people anticipate. So I, I, what, what I see is a country that doesn't have, I, not a single person says there's a, gla a gas vehicle on the, the, everything seems to be run by electricity. Um, they describe that it goes through phases, and I now can see these phases emerging. The first is building um, charging stations. That's a sort of the gas station model. But what they mostly describe in 2060 is that roadways uh, charge the vehicles that drive on them. And they're powered not uh, they're powered by uh, solar and wind, and that vehicles are quite different. People aren't traveling as much. Air travel still exists, but is there doesn't seem to be as much travel. Um, people, healthcare has radically changed. Um, not only do we seem to have in 2060 universal birthright uh, health care, as opposed to the kind of system we have now, I call it the illness profit system, um, but there also has just been a change in the technology of medicine, because the hospitals they describe seem very different than the hospitals that you would go to today. How so? Well, they, they're quieter. Uh, things seem more organic. In fact, in general, one of the major trends, I would say, in general with uh, the 2060s is that the things they describe seem more, not just organic, in the, but there seems to be an increased recognition that we live in a matrix of consciousness. And that all consciousness is interconnected and interdependent, and that people, that agriculture has changed radically. Um, that chemical, industrial, uh, uh, poison-based 
uh, uh, single monoculture agriculture seems to have been replaced by communities growing more of their own food. I'm, I'm, that's just what I'm working on right at the moment is, is looking at that particular material because they, the descriptions that they give is that people, A, don't move around as much, B, they live in smaller communities, and C, they seem to provide for themselves better locally than having large long distance shipping. The other thing which I haven't I haven't gotten into yet, but one of the things that I just personally was concerned about, so I asked about it, is the development of the CRISPR technology for genetic manipulation, genetic engineering. And my concern, I've written about this uh, several papers, is the uh, is the emergence of another hominid species, Homo superior. And um, so I'm trying to find out. For, I didn't ask it qu quite the way I would have asked it if I had known more about it when I started this several years ago. But I'm, I'm so I may get some more, do some more remote viewing, because I can see that the development of another hominid species would be very dramatic. Indeed, it would be. Uh, well. And there's so much to talk about, and I realize that the bulk of your data yet remains to be analyzed. One of the fascinating things I learned from reading your preliminary paper is that we now have tools available to look at this kind of data that didn't exist when you when you started out. And I know in specific you refer to uh, a Google database, I think it's called GDELT, uh, that includes just massive amounts of big data concerning events reported all over the globe and every news source. Yes, that and I also I've been very lucky, um, a uh, Russian born but American citizen now, uh, uh, AI specialist, and I got came to meet, he, he approached me and, and he has skills at manipulating the database in ways that I could not do. And he's got a team of, of, of uh, programming engineers. So I can ask a question and, and, cause I, and they can go through it and give me answers because I've got 10,000 pages of data. And so just trying to get through it and not miss something and to be able to see how the consensus is formed so that you get a, a percentage of how, what percentage of people see a particular thing. So they've been able for me, this uh, a fellow named Mark Cotty, and um, uh, his help has made a huge difference. Plus, as you say, Google and other sources, the, the ability to access data in 2022 is radically different than the ability in you know 1978, 79, 80, 81. So I'm I'm going to be able to to uh, get down into a fineness of detail that I would not otherwise have been able to do. Well, one of the things I've always admired about your work is your refinement of the consensus methodology. Uh, I know that methodology probably goes back to the mid-18th century. I think Alan Kardec, uh, the founder of the Spiritist Movement, used it when evaluating the reports of different mediums. He wanted to make sure that at least seven mediums agreed on any particular spiritual principle that he wrote about. But I know you've taken it to uh, another degree of refinement completely. And when you combine that with the cap capability of big data analysis, it seems to me you have a very powerful tool for, for doing something that most futurists couldn't have imagined until recently. Oh, yes, I think that's very true. And, and one of the things that is interesting to me, both with the 2050 data and now with the 2060 data. So I've been at this since 78. That's a long time, 2022. Is that 
most of the projections of futurists, you know, there's the famous uh, 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 bet between two futurists about the future in, in which they saw overpopulation as a huge problem and scarcity of resources and and most of the futurist things that came out of the 70s and 80s, Paul Ehrlich and that, that group, they, they, they just have not turned out to be very accurate. Whereas the remote viewing data um, has been, as I said earlier, the parts that are consensus, and yes, I break this down to a concept by concept analysis. So it's not just whole sentences, it's concept by concept. So you can get very specific. I mean, if I said, for instance, uh, the man interviewing me with the tan jacket and the white shirt with earphones, I've got tan jacket, uh, shirt, white earphones, you know, I've got six or seven concepts. And when you see those come up again and again with people, then you get a level of refinement that just hasn't existed. And that's how I did all the archaeological stuff was the same was the same thing. This, If you take the data and literally break it down to concept by concept, what you find out is that, A, you can get highly accurate data. I mean, typically we expect to see in most remote viewing experiments, and not just me, but other people, about 75% is correct or partially correct. But I, I'm at a level now where there are certain things where I would really be willing to, to make an investment on them, for instance, because I think it's that accurate. Uh, one being, for instance, I, I'm fascinated. If you look at all this business about converging uh, the the uh, the end of the internal combustion engine, and what everybody's worried about in the conversion is, will there be enough charging stations? But I now think that that the real future, and if I were going to be an investor, what I would be looking at is. How and, and there are a number of countries doing this, by the way, and it's particularly at Cornell University in the United States. How do you electrify the roadways themselves so that they can power the vehicles that drive on them? Because I, I think that's where it's headed. And so, but you only get that when you get down to asking little tiny questions like, you know, well, uh, if your battery runs out of runs out of electricity, what do you do? But then the, the viewers say, well, it doesn't. I said, what do you mean it doesn't? And they said, well, because when you drive on the road, it charges up your, your car. And the cars don't look the same. They have, their shapes are different and their tires are different. And the question is, is the whole roadway going to become electrified or will there be and what they're doing at Cornell, will there be charging lanes that um, trucks and cars and buses drive on? How's that going to work? So I'm trying to figure that out because what I'm looking for is guidance that you can give people who are planning to do some kind of project that this, uh, if you have five things that you could do, and you order them one, two, three, four, five. If I tell you number three will be the one that will work for you, and you do that one first, you may not have to do one, two, four, and five. So that's that's what I'm trying to do with this data. Well, as I recall from your preliminary report, roughly 35 to 40 percent of the specific information provided by the remote viewers can't be evaluated at all. I guess maybe it's uh, simply too vague or, or, or something to, uh, to count as either yes or no. So that leaves you 
leaves you with another 60% or so of, of the information that you obtain that you can evaluate. And of that, you're getting roughly 75-80% accuracy. Yes, that's correct. That's not just true of this particular project, but in general, in all of, the, all of my projects, the archaeology and criminology projects, you get a, you, there is a, a significant share of the data, 35 to 40%, that there's just no way to evaluate. For instance, if you're finding a sunken ship and uh, the remote viewer says the captain was thinking about his children uh, and his wife as his boat was sinking, well, I mean, that may be true, that's perfectly logical, but there's no way to ever check that unless he left a message or you know, left some kind of data that you could check. So I, as you know, I, I'm only interested in data that can be objectively verified. And so, uh, again, yes, you're correct. Between 35 and 40 percent, I don't know what to do with it because it's about feelings. It's about um, how people's attitudes about something change. Well, you know, I just there's no way to do that. So, but of the 60, 65% that remains, um, if this data is consistent with the other experiments, I expect to see 75 to 85% of it be correct or partially correct. For instance, by partially correct, I mean, if I said uh, the man interviewing me um, has, is wearing a jacket and it's brown. So the jacket part would be right. Wearing the jacket, that would be correct. But the brown would not be correct. It would be a tan. So, again, when you get down to the little tiny concepts, when you're down at that level of making an appraisal, then you really can find out, you know, if you interview seven people and five of them tell you that the person is wearing a jacket, even if they get the colors different, then you can be pretty sure they're wearing a jacket. Well, I can appreciate that the kind of analysis you're doing requires uh, a lot of patience and also an overview. That many people, when they, when they look at remote viewing and they were to see all of the data without appreciating the many steps that you have to take to parse through the data, might just give up and in, in despair and say remote viewing uh, can't possibly work. It's all too much uh, gobbledygook or something. That would be wrong, um, but uh, I would I would certainly agree with you. Remote viewing is not a magic bullet. It's not a you know it's not a it's not a, a thing that avoids work. It's a it's a technique like any technique that assesses information. You know, basically, I got this idea of the consensus. Uh, protocol, not only from Kardak, but also because I had been an investigative reporter. And, you know, if you're doing investigative reporting, you don't rely on one source. You go around, you interview a number of sources, and you see, you know, where do they agree, where do they disagree. And in the intelligence world, and I was in that world as well, they do the same thing. You know, you have human intelligence, you have um, electronic mechanical intelligence, so you don't, you're looking at all of the pieces and trying to figure out where the consensuses are. And so I'm doing exactly the same thing. It's just that the data is sourced from non-local consciousness. Well, you seem to have a unique ability to uh, explore areas where other people are afraid to go. For example, the archaeology projects. Uh, very few people have ever even endeavored to do what you have accomplished on multiple occasions. Uh, that's true. I, I'm actually, to be honest with you, Jeff, I was actually kind of surprised about that now looking back over the years. Because it has been so productive, I've, I've just been approached about doing another one, by the way. I don't know whether it's going to come to pass, but I'm at least in conversation with a man who would like to do some work locating things. And, and I think part of it is when I think about it, because I've asked myself that question, why do more people do this? 
is it's very expensive. I mean, that's part of it. You know, parapsychology, the, sh the funding is so modest. Uh, it's just, I mean, when back 70s, 80s, early 90s, you know, when Princeton and Mobius and SRI all existed, they were all operating with budgets in excess of a million dollars a year, a couple of million dollars a year. You know, I, I look at, for instance, the Eastern Harbor or the Alexandria project, which you and I have discussed. That project cost about $600,000 in 1979. That'd be about three and a half million dollars today. And I think part of it is there just isn't any funding and that it's very hard for people seem to have a hard time getting funding. I was, for whatever reason, I was lucky. Um, I met people, you know, who got interested and who had money and were willing to fund it. But I, it, the applications of non-local consciousness are, I think, really, I am surprised we are not focusing more on that. I am very surprised that that uh, and disheartened in a way that we seem to not be able to get through to recognize that we that culture is the result of individual choices based on individual consciousness and that where you have collective consciousness you have the ability to create cultural change. And, you know, we look at, for instance, Roger Nelson's uh, Global Consciousness Project, where he shows that, that where a large number of people uh, become focused on something, that there is a, a, literally reality changes in an objectively measurable way, but also the culture changes. I mean, you know, that's how Gandhi got independence for India without a, without a war. He changed, he was able to change the consciousness of the people of India. Or you look at what Martin Luther King did to how he got started with civil rights. What, what did he do? Did there was a law that was passed? They, they gave great sums of money? No, he changed the consciousness of individuals. And what I'm coming away with from both the 2050 and the 2060 data is that in our future, we are going to have a culture which is grounded on the idea that we live in a matrix of consciousness. You know, I've just been looking at papers over the last couple of weeks that uh, talking about how dependent we are on animals and insects and other things and we don't we don't think about that. You know, I mean, how, how often did most people think about bees? And yet 70 percent of the food we eat is dependent on pollination that occurs because of bees and the bees are under enormous threat. So when you recognize that you live in a matrix of consciousness, not the Abrahamic idea that, you know, we have dominion over the earth and it's a kind of like we got left a bank account by a rich uncle, and instead you begin thinking in terms of what I'm doing and what other people are doing is having an effect all across the matrix of consciousness, that change in consciousness, which is what I'm seeing, particularly in the 2060 people, that they, they talk about the world when they describe it from a different perspective. And that perspective is, this idea that we're all interlinked and that we are all interdependent. It seems as if the very ideas that you and I have been talking about continuously for the last half a century, maybe in another 40 years or so, will really take root uh, at, the, at the heart of our culture. I, I think so, and I hope so, because... You know, when I think about, for instance, your show, the Thinking Aloud, and the interviews that you've done, as I have told you, I think this is not only historically important, because when we do make this change, we're going to want to know, how did the people who created this change, what were they thinking about? 
I mean, I, for instance, personally have always wondered why did Newton find gravity and alchemy so interesting? He didn't leave any messages to tell us. So how did he get to that thought? And, and I think that if you think about all of the interviews that you've done and the millions of people that have listened to those interviews and been touched by them, and I know that it's a large number of people because I get emails all the time from people who tell me, I saw your interview with Jeff Mishlove on Thinking Aloud. I mean, literally every week, I realize, you know, that kind of work that changes consciousness it changes the way people look at things, the way they evaluate them. You know, and as we move into the future, the kind of world we want to have needs to be based on well-being, not profit. You can have profit, but you need to focus, first of all, on well-being. And I think when I get through with the 2050, 2060 data, with the analysis, that may be the biggest takeaway that we get. Well, Stefan, once again, it has been a uh, enriching and joyful experience to talk with you. I'm uh, grateful that you're still around. I wish, actually, that you had a, a host of apprentices who could learn from you because you have so much to offer. And I hope that uh, we can continue uh, doing these interviews uh, well into the future for both of us, because uh, I just love sharing this information. Uh, so thank you very much for being with me today. Thank you very much, Jeff, for doing what you're doing. And I completely support it. And I, too, would look forward. We have had many fascinating conversations, and both of us have learned something, and I think that's wonderful. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.